ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠತ ಜಾಗ್ರತ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯ ವಾರಾ ನಿಬೋಧತ ಕ್ಷುರ ಧಾರಾ ನಿಶಿತ ದುರತ್ಯಯ ದುರ್ಗಂ ಪಥಸ್ಥವಯೋ ವದಂತಿ arise awake and learn by approaching the excellent ones the wise ones describe that path to be as impassable as a razor's edge which when sharpened is difficult to tread on you creatures who are sleeping in ignorance that has no beginning utishtata arise turn towards the knowledge of the self jankrata awake put an end to the sleep of ignorance which is terrible by nature and is the seed of all evil how to put an end to it prapya approaching varan the adorable ones the excellent teachers who know that self nibodhata learn understand the all pervading self taught by them as i am that The Upanishad says out of compassion like a mother that this should not be neglected for the thing to be known is comprehensible by a very fine intellect what can that fine intellect be compared this is being said dhara the edge kshurasya of a razor nishita being sharpened becomes duratyaya such as can be passed over with great difficulty impassable as that razor is difficult to walk on with the feet similarly kavayaha the intelligent people vadanti describe pataha the path as durgam impassable that is hard to attain The idea is that since the object to be known is very subtle they speak of the path of knowledge leading to it as impassable then he introduces the next verse how very subtle is the thing to be known that is being said now then this earth is gross developed as it is by the principles of sound touch color taste and smell and it is an object of perception to all the senses so also is the body here a gradation of subtleness pervasiveness purity permanence etc is noticed in water etc through the elimination of the attributes of smell etc one by one till one reaches akasha space therefore what need is there to speak of the unsurpassable subtleness etc of that in which there do not exist those attributes beginning with smell and ending with sound that are the causes of grossness this is what the upanishad shows ashabdamasparshamarupamavyayang ತಥಾರಸಿತ್ಯಮಗಂಧವಚ್ಛಯತ್ ಅನ್ನಾಧ್ಯನಂತಂಗ್ಮಹತಾಪರಂ ಧ್ರುವಂ ನಿಚ್ಛಾಯತನ್ ಮೃತ್ಯುಮುಖಾತ್ ಪ್ರಮುಚ್ಯತೆ ಒನ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರೀಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಜಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡೆಥ್ ಬೈ ನೋಯಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಸೌಂಡ್ಲೆಸ್ ಟಚ್ಲೆಸ್ ಕಲರ್ಲೆಸ್ undiminishing and also tasteless eternal odorless without beginning and without end distinct from mahat and ever constant and the tika yat that which is described as ashabdam soundless asparsham touchless arupam colorless avyayam undiminishing tata and also arasam tasteless nityam eternal that is the undecaying brahman that which is possessed of sound etc diminishes but this one being soundless etc is avyayam it does not diminish does not decay 
and because of this it is eternal. Whatever decays is non-eternal, but this one does not decay, therefore it is permanent. For this further reason, too, it is eternal, that that which has no adi beginning, cause, is anadi, beginningless. That which has a cause is impermanent because it is an effect and it merges into its cause, as for instance, earth, etc. But this one being the cause of all is not the effect, and hence it is eternal. It has no cause into which it can merge. Similarly, anantam, infinite, that which has no end. As the plantain, etc., are seen to be impermanent after yielding their products in the form of fruits, etc., not even that way has Brahman any finitude. Hence, too, it is eternal. Mahataha, from the principle Mahat, called buddhi, intelligence. It is param, distinct by nature, for it is the witness of all, being eternal consciousness, and it is Brahman, being the self of all beings. For it has already been said, he is hidden in all beings, Katupanishad 1, 3, 12, and dhruvam, is that which is changelessly constant, whose eternality is not relative, unlike that of the earth, etc. Nichaya, realizing, tut, that self, the self that is the Brahman of this kind, pramuchyate, one gets freed from, detached from, mrityumukhat, from the jaws, the grasp of death which consists of ignorance, desire, and action. Namaste. So now we are almost at the end of the third chapter. And uh, Death is finishing up his preliminary instructions on the path. And Nachiketa, we must assume, is hearing very nicely because he doesn't ask any more questions up to this point. Uh, not since the second chapter, the beginning of the second chapter. So he must be understanding it well. And we know already that Nachiketa is very intelligent, so there's nothing unusual about this. But now death becomes exhortative. Arise, awake, learn by approaching the excellent ones. So this is the path of enlightenment. Huh? You have to arise. You have to get up out of your ignorance and your sloth and your laziness and your stupidity and tear yourself away from the things that keep you in this material world. And then you have to arise, awake, to the situation. And Gurdjieff called this the terror of the situation. In other words, here we are on planet Earth in the human form, and yet, even though we are spiritual beings at the core, we are subjected to so many conditions that we didn't choose and that we don't want, and yet, if we don't meet them, we will be held responsible. We went over this existential human condition way back in the beginning of this channel in the series on being in the world. And this is what we have to see, that we are in terrible danger. And of course, the danger is that we won't get liberation and that we will have to be reborn. And, you know, it's throwing the dice. We, we don't know how and where and in what condition we're going to be reborn. Because we don't know what karma we have waiting from past lives. We don't remember our past lives because our subtle bodies are destroyed by death. They are eaten, literally, by death and the other demigods, the other immortals. This is their food. 
and we are being raised like animals, like cattle, and led to slaughter. Only one who arises and awakes to this condition can approach the excellent ones, the knowers of Brahman, and get the truth from them. And while knowledge of the truth is not enough to guarantee liberation, that is where we have to start. So the first thing is to hear Shravanam from someone who actually knows Brahman, who has realized Brahman. And the next thing is Mananam, consideration, or thinking it over. We could call it understanding what we have heard. In other words, connecting the truth of I am Brahman with everything else in our experience, in our mind, in our memory, and so on. And, and this is called like digestion. Huh? Simply hearing is like eating, like putting food in your mouth. But then after hearing, one has to digest what one has heard so that we can proceed to the next stage, which is nididasana, which means putting it into practice and actually doing the meditations that lead to freedom. And those meditations are being described herein. So if you haven't understood the last few videos, they give a complete program of meditation and what you have to do to get free of the conditioning that leads to rebirth. And basically, I mean, in a nutshell, it's very simple. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am pure, objectless awareness, unconditioned, boundless, infinite oneness, with no differences at all. No boundaries, no qualities, no actions, no knowledge, no even consciousness. So in this connection, I would like to read a couple of shlokas from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which explains this in great detail and great depth. As a lump of salt dropped into water dissolves with its component water, and no one is able to pick it up, but whensoever one takes, it tastes salt. Even so, my dear, this great, endless, infinite reality is but pure intelligence. The self comes out as a separate entity from these elements, and this separateness is destroyed with them. After attaining this oneness, it has no more consciousness. This is what I say. This was spoken by the great sage Yajnavalka. Yajnavalka, well, Yajna means sacrifice, and Valka means a dress made of bark. In olden days, the forest dwellers, the ascetic monks, the Advaitins, used to live in the, in the jungle, and they would make their clothes out of things they found in the jungle, like the bark of trees and so on. So I'm not sure exactly what kind of bark. <laughs> it must have been rather scratchy, but they didn't care because they're not the body, and they've realized it. So he gives the example of a lump of salt. If you dissolve a lump of salt in water, it disappears. But if you taste the water anywhere, it tastes of salt. So in the same way, this Brahman is, as it were, dissolved in the world. Actually, of course, the world is depending on Brahman. Brahman is the root, the cause, and the support of the world. But for purposes of understanding the nature of Brahman, he gives a simile, uh, like salt dissolved in water. And then he ends up, after attaining this oneness, there is no more consciousness. Well, this is radical. And why is that? He explains. Because when there is duality, as it were, 
Then one smells something, one sees something, one hears something, one speaks something, one thinks something, one knows something. But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one smell and through what? What should one see and through what? What should one hear and through what? What should one speak and through what? What should one think and through what? What should one know and through what? Through what should one know that owing to which all this is known? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, should one know the knower? So this is the ultimate conundrum of Brahman. When we realize, first of all, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, this is equivalent to realizing the secondary or the lower Brahman, the Brahman with qualities, Saguna Brahman, Devi, the goddess, Shakti. And this realization leads to the world of Shakti, which is a world of form, but it's only spiritual. There's no matter in it. It's only consciousness. And this world lasts continuously without any devastation until the end of the universe. And after that, in the Mahapralaya, the destruction of the entire universe, it is absorbed back into the higher Brahman, which is without qualities, without form, without any separate personal identities, and so on. So he is saying that when you realize the higher Brahman, that all this is one, not only I am Brahman, everything else is also Brahman. One sees the world in Brahman and Brahman in the world. Then, what is there to know? There's no difference between the knower and the known. So how can there be knowing? There's no difference between the subject and the object. So how can there be consciousness? See? This is the final state. This is nirvana, nibbana. This is nirvikalpa samadhi, where there are no thoughts, no images, no forms, no actions, no qualities, nothing. Except <laughs> pure Brahman, which is nothing but unlimited consciousness, unlimited being, and unlimited bliss. That is the destination of the knower of Brahman. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>